So there was this guy, and he was like 23 years old, and it was about time for him to get married. So he goes to his shop to whatever, and he starts finding she do her to start dating. And he's dating and dating, and he's going for months and months. It's already three, four months already. And he doesn't have, he doesn't have what? He doesn't like anybody. So his Rosh Hashiva, the, the, the head of the school, calls him in. He calls him in for a, for a meeting. And he brings, him, he brings him to the office, and he asks him, so, what's the problem? He says, you know, no one's good enough for me. He says, what, you, what, you know one's good enough for you? He's like, yeah, I'm, I'm too good for all, all, all these people. I need, I need someone that's really, really good. So the Rosh Hashiva smiles, and he says, you know, you know, you need take out a sefer, Mesil Isharin, take a, take a, take a sefer that's going to make you humble, study that for three months straight, come to me after, after you, after you finish the book, after you finish this, this, this making yourself humble, and then come back. So he reads the book, he reads the book, and he's becoming, he's becoming more and more humble. And finally, he comes back. To, he comes back to the to the Rosh Hashiva with his with his shoulders his shoulders up, his neck his neck down, and he goes to the Rosh Hashiva and he, he says, "You know, I'm ready." And the Rosh Hashiva smiles and he says, "Okay, go try to find try to find start dating again." And he goes one month, two months, three months pass again, and he can't find a wife. So he goes he goes back to the Rosh, the, the, the Rosh Hashiva's room, the, the principal's room again, and he says, "What happened? I thought I thought you became you, you became humble." He said, "Yeah, but you don't understand. Before, when I was when I was about that, when I when I when I was when I was very when I was very hot, everyone no no one was good enough for me. Now that I'm humble, for sure, no one's good enough for me. <laughs> so, humility, humbleness, anava in Hebrew is a very very important thing, and we all need it. The first word of this week's parsha is parsha Vayikra. We see Vayikra, and at first glance, you see something right away. You see the small Aleph." There's a Vayikra and the Aleph of it is small. So why is there a small Aleph? The classical answer, the classical answer is that, it's, that the Aleph is small because Moshe Rabbeinu didn't want this Vayikra to be under his name. Rashi HaKadosh says that this Vayikra is because of a Lashon Shiva. It's a Lashon of, uh, of, of love that Hashem had for him. And Moshe Rabbeinu didn't want anyone to know about this. So he said, take the whole, the, the whole first pasuk out, I don't want it. Just, 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 just start with commanding me things. Why, why do I need this language of love? So Hashem and Moshe made a compromise, and they made the Aleph small, to show that Moshe made was humble, and he didn't really want it there. The question is, why make the Aleph small? Why not make the Vav small, or the Yud small? Make a different letter in the Vayikra small. Why are you picking the Aleph? The Aleph signifies the word Aluf. Aluf means leader, the, the, the head. We know the Aleph in, in all of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet is the closest one to Hashem. So why are you, be, why are you belittling it with making, by, by, by making it small? The second question seemingly has nothing to do with this, and it's on later on in the parasha. We had the whole parasha is speaking about all the korbanot that, that, were, that, were, that were brought. Chata, that is not. And the Rambam goes in great depth to teach us that if you don't have the right mashaba, if your intentions when you're doing the korban is not good, the whole korban is pasul. So if it's such an important thing, and if it's so important for you to have the correct mashaba, how come there's no pasul? How come the, the, the pasukim don't talk about it? It should say, one of the very, very important things is your mashaba, and if you don't have the right mashaba, you're going to make the korban pasul. Why, not, why isn't that the first thing to say, if it's so important? The answer is really, that there is, it is, the intentions are really set in there. What are the, where are the intentions that, that the Rambam speaks about? We know that if you look at the korbanot, there are a few different types of korbanot. There are korbanot that you have to give, and there are korbanot that are optional, that you can give. Which one comes first in the, in the listing? The voluntary ones come first. Why are we listening to the why are we listening to the voluntary korban first? We should listen to the, the, the korban you have to do first. The answer is because just like when there's something voluntary and when there's something that you don't necessarily have to do and it's just coming from your good heart, just like over there you have the correct intention, the correct machshava, the correct kavana, that this is completely for Hashem and Hashem is way higher than you and you're just doing this to show some appreciation for Hashem. So to all the korbanot, all the offerings should be like that. 
The Menesh Chai says that if you don't have the correct machshava, you're like a bird with no wings. If you don't have the correct machshava, if you don't have the correct intention, your bird, yourself, your neshama, won't fly. It won't go to Hashem. If you just say a mitzvah, if you just say a bracha, if you give tzedakah, if you do something, but you do it half-heartedly, and you're not really meaning what you're doing, you've created a bird, you've created a goof. But that bird has no wings. The body has no neshama to it. There's no meaning to what, to what you're doing. Of course, at the same time, you can't just have kavanah, because then it's just a pair of wings. Right? That's nothing. You need a goof, but at the same time, the machshava is extremely important. And the Shulchan Aruch goes even further. And he says that animals, they live, they eat, they sleep, they do all these things. Humans also do the same thing. We eat, we eat, we, we sleep. We do the same thing. What's the difference between us and an animal? Us, we infuse Kedusha in what we're doing. How do we infuse Kedusha in eating? How do we infuse Kedusha in sleeping? If we have the Mashaba and say, I'm doing this for Hashem. In Hashem's infinite wisdom, I'm trying to aspire to Him by, by doing some type of Avodah to Him. That's the importance of our Mashaba. We know that the, there was a story about the Chazon Ish. And he flew in to America and he sees streetlights hanging from the streets. He's never seen one before. And he's walking towards the streetlight in amazement how the, 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 street, the street is lit. And he stops, he looks at the streetlight and he walks back. And he tries again to walk to the streetlight. And he looks at the streetlight, he looks at himself, and he just keeps walking back and going forth and back and forth and back and forth. Until the Zamidim said to the Chazon Ish, what are you doing? And he said, it's a fascinating. This light has taught me something. As I get closer to the light, the shadow behind me gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Till I'm directly under the light, I have no shadow at all. What was he saying? He's saying when a person gets closer and closer to the light, gets closer and closer to Hashem and learns and learns more about Hashem until he's directly under Hashem, then he realizes, what is he? He's nothing. But if a person is far away from Hashem, he doesn't really know about Hashem. He's big, he has a huge shadow following behind him. What's this whole thing about the small Aleph? The Aleph represents someone that yes, he has the correct mashaba, and yes, he, he, he knows where he stands. And he's an aloof. He's, he's the leader. But what makes him so great is the fact that he's small. It's the fact that he got so close to Hashem that he realizes how small he is. There's a basuk that says, In my entire house, there's one person that, that is trustworthy. Who was he? Moshe Rabbeinu. Why was Moshe Rabbeinu trusted so much in Hashem's house? Because he was the one that had the right machshava. He was a leader, but at the same time, he knew where he stood. He knew that he was small. Now about time. Your mashabot are always so pure. You always, you always know what to do. You always do the right thing. In fact, I saw this past Purim. This past Purim, when we were giving out the Mishlah of Mano, all we were really doing, we were just signing our names on the things, the, the forms that come to send to multiple different people. And those, that was the Mishlah of Mano that we were doing. But Sarah said that what does she want to do? She wants to give Mishlah Abana to other people. She wants to really give much Mishlah Abana, not, not just write your name on something and send it out. She wants to get a real Mishlah Abana. So she asked my father, and we drove over to a store, and we bought a bunch of different goods, a bunch of different stuff. We bought bags and candies and this and this and that. Sarah's getting all these things from the supermarket. She comes home, she stuffs, it, she stuffs all of them. And not only she wanted to send it just to her friends, but she actually wanted to send it to the hospital for the people that don't necessarily get Mishlach Mano. And she went to the hospital and delivered these, and de delivered these Mishlach Mano to people. And sure enough, a letter came to our house addressed to Sarah saying, thank you so much for giving us these Mishlach Mano. The people in the hospital really, really appreciated it. Her machshavot are always so pure. In fact, the morning of Purim, I saw something on my door. And it said this. 
It says in the top of the header, it says, read in at 12.31 a.m. It says, dear Eliyahu, please wake me up so I can go to the Megillah with you, to go to the Megillah reading with you. Thanks, Sarah. And imagine 10 of these little green things posted all over the house. One was posted on my door. I read it. I get out of the door, and I see another one. In case you didn't get the first one, here's the second one. I walked a little further down. In case you didn't get a second one, here's the third one. And there are reminders all throughout the house, waking me up at 7.30 to hear the Megillah with you. How pure of a mashallah is this? So happily I went into Sarah's room. I said, Sarah, it's 7, it, it, it's 7 o'clock, let's go hear the Megillah. She said, no, oh, I'm too tired. I want to go to the <laughs> I said, Sarah, let's go to the Megillah. I said, fine, there's, a, there's another one later at 11. She's like, oh, I'm going to get that one. She ended up hearing the Megillah at 2 p.m. The fact is that her mashallah was very, very pure. She wanted to hear the Megillah early in the morning. It is who Sarah is. Whenever there is a chance to do something, to help a friend, to do anything, Sharma Shabbat are always so pure. And she always wants to she always wants to do the right thing. And what you have to remember, Sarah, is that you are the aluf in the word Vahikra. You are the aluf. You are the leader. And the more a leader you'll become, the, the further away you'll see yourself at Hashem. And the greater and greater you'll become. And the more nachad you'll give to Abba and Mami and the whole Kali Yisrael. Thank you.